This week on Around the Coin, we talk about the changing landscape of remittances. Our in-house expert, Faisal Khan, explains the current state of world remittances and a few major business opportunities over the next few years. Around the Coin. All right, guys, how's everyone doing today? We have a very exciting show. We'll be talking about remittances, uh, cross-border. We have Faisal Khan, Brian Romley, Mike Towns, and myself on the show. Um, Faisal is one of the world experts. Brian gives a great perspective here in the States. And, uh, you know, it's going to be a talk about how remittances work, what are they, um, how they affect business, and what major business opportunities lie in remittances. It's a huge market. Um, and we've got a lot to talk about. So with that said, Faisal, do you want to jump in and maybe just tell us uh, what remittances are? Well, hi. Uh, well, remittances are essentially part of the cross-border money transfer trade. And uh, remittances is, uh, is actually short for home remittances. And it's specifically money sent by, you know, expatriates working in other countries who send family maintenance money back home. So this is, you know, a uh, Filipino working in, let's say, the U.S., and they send, I don't know, $300 equivalent every month back home to support their family. That's what remittances are essentially classified as, uh, home remittances. Uh, today, it's about a $550 billion market uh, per year worldwide. It's huge. Uh, and it keeps it is one of the only industries that I think, since I've been tracking it since 1992, has been growing year on year. It's never gone down. It always grows. It, sometimes it grows very small, but it's been growing year on year. It has never gone down. Uh, the overall remittance market size is estimated to be about $960 billion. It's massive. And if you were to ask, uh, well, where's the rest of it? Well, the rest of it is undocumented remittances or what we would call hawala or hundi money, you know. Uh, so this is money that is not sent through official channels, but sent through uh, unofficial channels, and it's not documented by the receiving country. But the official uh, amount is about uh, 550 billion or so, and uh, you know thousands and thousands of one families in the receiving countries depend on it, and the receiving economies depend on it. Hmm. Now it's 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 almost so large that it. Uh I think across different countries, you know, you have, there's a great graph we'll include in, include in the references of this post, uh, but it shows graphically where the money flows in and out of various countries. And you can kind of get a sense, right, for how enormous this is. Um, largely, Faisal, would you agree that it's expats and uh, labor workers going into other countries and sending money back home to their families? Is that generally the experience? It is. Uh, I mean, uh, the Middle East is obviously very well known, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, UAE, etc., where you have a lot of labor class that is essentially building up the economies over there because it's very, you know, I mean, you talk about construction and, you know, dams and bridges and what have you, you do need laborers to work on it. And, and, and countries in Southeast Asia and South Asia and Southeast Asia have exported a lot of labor manpower to these countries. So they send a lot of money back home, albeit it's small, you know, $100, $200 per month. But when you multiply that with thousands of tens of thousands of laborers, uh, it adds up. And then you have the uh, sort of a mix between the blue collar and the white collar that go to the developing nations in, you know, let's say, the U.S., Canada, Europe, U.K., etc., that send money back home. Uh, and they also are doing the same thing, sending money back home for purposes of family maintenance. And uh, uh, they contribute towards their home economies in a, in a, in a pretty significant way. You know, it's very interesting. My perspective is going to be radically different uh, in the United States, <clears throat> um, looking at the way that remittances started, I mean, really, it's got a history in Great Britain, 1792, when uh, the very first money order uh, was established by a, a private uh, company. Uh, name was lost in history, but pretty well documented. It wasn't until, you know, we got into the mid-1800s that postal authorities jumped into this. In fact, we could go back to the 1700s and look at how Benjamin Franklin, as the original postmaster, um, was pushing to use um, uh, 
uh, the postal system to move money. And that, in fact, happened, but it happened more by moving stamps uh, than an official money order, although there were examples where that was taking place more on a private level in the early 1700s. But if you look at how money was moving in the early part of the United States. It's very interesting. A lot of money was moving into the United States from Europe and the postal system was delivering. We were the more, um, uh, you know, being funded by our family and friends back home out here in the wilderness, if you will. And uh, it didn't start reversing the um, trajectory until the the Chinese immigrant um, uh, pool was being built uh, to construct the railroads. And at that point, the U.S. postal system was radically involved in moving the money. Uh, so was obviously the trains. Uh, you know, the the worker would get paid. They would get a certain percentage uh, given to the postmaster. Uh, postmaster would convert that into currency. In fact, the very first wire currency was because of that. The telegraph was being used to send, you know, money out of New York or out of uh, San Francisco directly overseas as what essentially was a money order. So it really has a rich history. But it wasn't until the 1950s that it was really started to be considered more regulated. Uh, Obviously, the post office of the United States was a primary money order generator. But over the decades um, uh, from the mid-50s to the 70s, hundreds and thousands of private entities started creating money orders. And unfortunately... There were not very clear rules. So a lot of states started looking at this and realizing that especially immigrants were very vulnerable in California, Texas, Arizona. Primarily, you saw some of these laws uh, coming up where a fly-by-night money order company would take in thousands and thousands of dollars a month and then disappear. Wow, that was really happening, huh? Yes, this was happening all the way up into the 1990s. It was Boy. a major failure of a money order uh, company in the early 1990s. And so that pushed regulators down the road of regulating because that's what they do. They looked at it. You know, people were, were, were crying over this. Uh, it had a rich history also of, um, of uh, charlatans and, uh, and uh, snake oil salesmen uh, during the, um, uh, the boom of the farming culture in, uh, in the Central Valley of California. Uh, that particular environment was particularly uh, complex because there were all sorts of middle parties that were taking chunks of this money that the immigrant workforce, who was here legally at that time, it was a different uh, immigrant policy, uh, were taking pieces of that money as it was going back to Mexico and deep into South America. Um, obviously, the world changed uh, towards um, the early 2000s and moving money around became uh, much more of a federal issue. But prior to that, uh, money orders w- were pretty much regulated at a state level through the money transmitter acts that were being developed individually in each state. The premise was to try to protect uh, the consumer, <clears throat> but the end result was to block creativity and innovation because once you had a stakeholder in place, maybe Western Union, maybe American Express, maybe a few others, they pretty much wanted to roll up the ladders and say, no, we can't trust these small companies. Uh, they don't, they're not you know, worthy of moving this money around. And here we are, 2014, and we're trying to look at ways to make money move quicker and more efficiently, take out the inefficiencies from the market. Uh, whereas money orders in the United States still represent magnet- orders of magnitude still higher than Western Union and other forms of payment and, for remittances back to South Brian, America. Brian, what's, what's the experience like back then compared to now if you're working in a farm or you're an expat somewhere and you need to transfer money back, you know, in that snake oil salesman area time, would you just go to a local, uh, you know, a person, you know, behind his wagon? I mean, what, what is the area? You're actually going it, to a facility and they're giving you a receipt and then you, how, how do they get verification that the money's transferred? It, it was and actually, very fragmented, very fragmented. Your paymaster uh, would usually have uh, either a relationship or he himself would act in this regard. 
Uh, the U.S. Post Office was trying very vigorously to interface with some of the larger operations, especially the large and, uh, largest farms in the Central Valley of California. They would actually send people out there from the post office and try to get these transactions to be done out in the field because literally these people were working 18 hours a day. They didn't have time to even get out. Mm -hmm. So they were very vulnerable. They knew they had to take care of their families. So the paymaster took advantage of that. And sometimes it was all right. Sometimes the paymaster, even though he took maybe 18, 20 percent, you know, that's how, how bad it was getting. Uh, some of the uh, the coyotes out there would go and and appear to take less, but actually take more. And most of the time, there was always a fear of whether the money would actually show up. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of trust, a lot of corruption, and um, there's a lot of quote-unquote taxes that were being taken out uh, for protection of that money. Because once somebody got paid, see, if you were a migrant worker, once you got paid uh, on payday, you're vulnerable. Right, there are all right. sorts of things. There was gambling, prostitution, all different things that were vying to alcohol, uh, drugs, uh, you know, but primarily gambling to try to vie to take your money away. And um, uh, that's why a lot of family and wives back at home would say, just give the paymaster his piece so you're never touching that money and it comes home. You know, and these were big problems. And, you know, uh, there, were, there was talk in, in the uh, 1800s where government, you know, on a federal level wanted to really get into this and, uh, uh, and, and, and quote unquote fix it. But, you know, there, and there were, you know, variations of laws that tried to, to change this. But it, it represented too much of a financial uh, resource for the postal system. If you took remittances out of the postal system, it wouldn't have existed as we know today. It, it just wouldn't. Uh, it, it, it was one of the primary funding uh, vehicles for the entire system. Uh, and uh, so the only reason why we have a mailman coming five days a week, you know, six days a week, you know. It just sends time. from there, huh? And with, Absolutely. How about Western Union? I mean, they're such an, uh, a you know, historic company founded in, founded in 1851. They yes. still are a dominant player in uh, money transmitter remittances, right? I mean, is there a – it's amazing how they've made that transition. I, I, I know that in uh, 1900, turn of the century, <clears throat> they created the first – the two largest international underseas cables, uh, telegraph yes. lines, um, which essentially became what would be the first international remittances, right? And then, you know, from that point, they remain – uh, one of the largest money movers across the world. Yeah, that was a major capital investment at the time. Uh, it was brilliant, and it created an incredible m monopoly. So much, so much so that um, at the formation of what we now might know as the Bell System in AT and T, uh, there were there was a lot of fear and paranoia over whether or not the phone system could be utilized in in the way that Western Union was utilizing it. And um, it, it, it's funny. Uh, a lot of the um, a lot of the regulation in the early um, uh, you know formation of the Bell system uh, was politically motivated uh, by uh, foundations that uh, uh, Western Union had in protecting their interests. Uh, you know, so it, it, it's funny how. Once somebody gets in a, a position, obviously they want to stay in that position, but it's funny how the politics can actually extend that into decades. You know, mm -hmm. you couldn't, for example, you couldn't connect, connect a, a telefax or a facsimile machine or these early devices um, for years. Some of them were invented. The original telefax was actually invented uh, many, many decades before they were actually connected to the public phone system. And a lot of it had to do with the politics of, of allowing that to happen. There was fear. There was a, a fear that it would uh, uh, really disrupt a lot of uh, uh, business practices hmm. uh, because you can obviously move information quicker. Now, of course, you can make place a phone call, but you got to remember making phone calls overseas in that epoch was far more costly. And you would call that a transaction fee today, right? If, if it costs you $25 essentially to make a call in, in today's money, right? Uh, would you make it to move $50 or $100? No, mm. no, you can't. So we got to remember the early bell system was only a, primarily a voice analog system. And when it was going to start moving in the le level of being digitalized, there was a lot of political might pulling it away because there was so much 
um, you know, momentum to keep things not moving so quickly, which is what's going on with the ACH system in America today. There's all sort of you know, history always repeats itself and human beings always act in the same manner. It, it's, you know, and uh, legacy that's systems. Right. And then, Absolutely. Brian, if you speed up today, what's what do you see in the states as far as the experience for immigrant workers sending money back home? Now they're walking up to a Western Union and sure. they are giving a check. That money gets sent with a fee associated with it to a bank account back home. The family then collects the money, walks in, walks away with walks away with cash after proving uh, valid identification. Um, you know, uh, still thing, inefficiencies, but yeah. yeah. The thing is, it it, it uh, one will argue who who owns the bigger percentage still, whether it's a U.S. post office or Western Union. Now, uh, it, it it is the U.S. Post Office really doesn't finite break down what real uh, money order usage is about and who's doing it because they don't really collect that data, but they could as- assimilate some of that data, but they don't. Um, if if the dollar amount is low enough, it is going to be a money order and it's going to be sent in the mail. And um, it's uh, it's interesting. If you go to some of the regions where there are in, in uh, California, where there still is migrant uh, farm workers, you will see sometimes on payday, uh, the very next morning, you'll see people lining up at the post office. Uh, and sometimes uh, post offices in those regions will open up at 6 a.m. or even 5 a.m. so that they can get in line to get their money orders back home. Hmm. And these are the guys that hopefully – are not gambling, spending, and, you know, drinking away, you know, what should be going back home. And this has always been a problem. And, and it's funny, you talk about how could this industry really change? That's really the pain point. Mm-hmm. The pain point is what happens f- to the money from the point the person gets it to the point the person who needs to receive it receives it. Mm-hmm. And in different parts of the world, uh, you know, there's all sorts of complications to that. Uh, you know, different cultures have different, you know, mechanisms to try to control that embarrassment, uh, you know, motivation, sending a brother or not. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, but the bottom line is, you know, the reliance upon the flow of money back home is tremendous. And um, these people are just about a half a paycheck away from being put out in the street. I mean, it's very tight. You know, keeping it U.S. concentric, concentric, I'd love to switch gears a little bit as we discuss what it's like on the, you know, United States is the largest um, immigrant, immigrant, immigrant country um, to hear the other side, you know, to see all the, all the countries, all the people there immigrate to the States, uh, send money back home. Um, Faisal, do you, do you, how do you, how do you think about all this? How do you, what do you think about remittances? Where do you think it's going? What stands out as the most interesting things? I mean, you're one of the, the world's leader in remittances. Uh, you have, you know, hundreds of answers across Quora. Well, give me your thoughts. What are you thinking? Well, <clears throat> it's interesting you say that because I think remittances are here to stay. They will continue to grow. Uh, uh, I, you know, I, I, Brian touched upon a point that I really want to say because Western Union actually used to do that telegraphic transfer, uh, you know, by tapping on that Morse code kind of a device. And that's how the the, the original TT uh, telegraphic transfer came out. Uh, that yes. Uh, yes. that uh, acronym or rather uh, you know, nomenclature is still used today. You know, TT charges uh, still applicable even when they went into the telex system and now the facsimile and, and today with the SWIFT. So it's still there. And uh, one other thing I wanted to point out is the post office in almost every country is by uh, pretty much by law, the de facto um, money transmitter. Uh, they, they essentially have some form of a very crude banking license to do you know, money transmission. So almost in every country of the world, you know, be it India, be it Pakistan, China, what have you, uh, the post office, you know, is still licensed to do money transmission. However, you know, with the advent of technology, et cetera, they've sort of lost ground because other com- you know, companies like Western Union, MoneyGram, Ria Financial, et cetera, they have come and made that entire process so seamless and so frictionless. Uh, they charge a fee for it, no doubt, but they've made it so frictionless that it is now very difficult to sort of, you know, uh, dethrone them. Um I mean, the, the, in, in the remittance industry, there's a thing called MTCN, which is Money Transfer Control Number. 
an MTCN is essentially a transaction number that you use to say, well, so here's my MTCN, you know, my money's arrived, and, you know, they'll tap it into the Western Union system and they'll bring up the credentials and then they'll say, you know, give me your ID and show me your ID. Okay, yep, the money is yours. Uh, so just like we refer to the Kleenex or the Xerox, et cetera, the same way, you know, uh, Western Union created the MTCN and ev- everywhere across in the remittance industry, the unique identifier is called MTCN. Western Union's advantage was that, you know, despite having a very large footprint uh, for telegraphic transfers, they went into each and every country, registered there, became a money transmitter, became a money service business, or in, in fact, the correct term would be an MTO, a money transfer operator, and, you know, seamlessly connected their entire world together based on their cable network and their cable systems to move money very seamlessly. And And the concept is actually... Very old, if you look at the money transmission concept, it comes from you know, perhaps from 100 years ago when you used to have, you know, the Knights Templars used to have that special seal on their documents for people going to, you know, for their uh, pilgrimage. And they would just give that uh, document over there and just based on that seal and that message in that seal, you would get your money. You don't, you, you need not physically carry your money. Uh, and that premise is still very much in existence today. I mean, you know, we are all familiar with the words like Hundi or Hawala, Hawala being the undocumented money transfer. There's a, there's a, there's a word that many, very few people know about, and it's, uh, it's called Fiquan. And Fiquan is the Chinese Hawala. Hmm. Uh, and the Chinese now, Hawala you, has been the... Can you define that? What is, what is, because these are, I've heard these words throughout the last 30 years, you know, as I talk to merchants, what exactly does that mean when it's translated exactly from, you know? So and I'll, I'll give you an analogous uh, example and then I'll give you the actual example. So if you cross a street at a zebra crossing, that is money transmission in, in the correct manner. If okay. you jaywalk, that's hawala. Mm. <laughs> so it's, it's the, when you transfer money through the authorized banking channels, and it is documented, and the key word here, it is documented by both parties acknowledging that the money was transferred. When, when I, both parties, I mean both the regulators that the money was, that the transaction was transferred. That is, uh, you know, an official white transfer. However, if you were to transfer money or settle money somehow without both the regulators knowing or any one of the regulators knowing that a transfer has been made, or undocumented transfer, that is Hawala. So it's an unofficial transfer. For example, I want to send my, you know, my brother back home $100. So rather than sending the $100, I just tell my other guy who happens to be in Pakistan saying, listen, dude, why don't you give my brother $100? And remember, you need to pay someone in Chicago $100? I'll give them $100, you know? Mm. So uh, you, you're settling it without the two con- the regulators even knowing that such a transaction is happening. There's so literally money is not even crossing the border. No, no, it does. And many times it does. But uh, the, the difference being that there is a huge difference, uh, there's a huge disagreement as to what Hawala is. So an undocumented transfer in one country is illegal, but that very same transfer in another country could be legal. There's a financial task force based out of Paris for anti-money laundering, and they have their you know, convention every, I think, six months or so. And I think it's been a point of great debate over there. You know, can we agree on a universal definition of what Hawala is? And you had countries fighting with the United States and the UK, et cetera. And, you know, it all came down to the same thing. You said, you know, in, with, if I were to take the U.S. definition strictly, everything would fall under Hawala. However, if I take the Swiss definition, 80% of the things would fall into white and 20% into gray. So it's, it, it is a matter of definition. You know, what may be legally uh, illegal in one country may not be uh, illegal in the other country. It's all about how you document it. If the U.S. says, well, if you're not documenting it this way, you wow. know, such and such way, I would consider this a Hawala transaction. And then you may have the Indian government or the Pakistan government or the Bangladesh or, you know, Sri Lanka, Philippines, Nepal argue, well, no, that's not the way we're going to dock. We don't agree on that premise. And well, the U.S. has the muscle to flex it. We'll say, okay, fine. Then I'm going to just, you know, classify this as a Hawala transaction. So what you do is you essentially put a lot of peer pressure, accounting pressure, oversight pressure, you know, uh, on these receiving economies to ensure that the systems can track 
very minutely as to where the transactions are going, how they're being structured, etc., so that do, they do not fall under the Hawala category. So even in the Hawala uh, or Fequen systems, there are two types of transaction. One is where money is transported across without showing up um, in the official registry, so to speak, uh, for lack of a better word. So you may have someone carrying $5,000 with him and, you know, it takes a flight from Chicago to New Delhi and lands and gives the money so that you guess what? You just did a very long, but nonetheless, you did a money transfer. And then you have someone, you know, from Chicago who needs to send money to New Delhi. And guess what? There's someone in New Delhi who wants to send money to New York. So the guy in Chicago says, well, hold on, I'll just send the money to New York. Why don't you just pay my parents in New Delhi and we'll call it even. And yeah. that's what they do. So that's called netting it. And, and, uh, and, and netting is not a net off. It's not a very uh, a new concept. It's been there for hundreds and thousands of years. Well, not thousands of years, but hundreds of years at least. Uh, and uh, if you look at your players like uh, Currency Fair or TransferWise, uh, the peer-to-peer uh, you know, money transfer, that's exactly how they are operating. You know, If you want to send money from Australia to Ireland, you don't really need to ship the money if you can find a transaction that is reversed. That someone needing send, someone who has a need to send money from Ireland to Australia. And if you can somehow match those two transactions together, guess what? No money is moved. You just take your fees and you net it off the transaction. So again, the regulator comes in and says, well, you know, for example, in UK, uh, the regulator made a lot of hue and cry about it. It said, well, no, the money, the money has to physically leave or digitally leave the UK for it to be, uh, you know, such and such transaction. But then they made an exception to it, et cetera, and so forth. So it, it's, again, it had the UK not made an exception, any net of transaction would automatically be classified as Hawala. I mean, you know, there's, there's nothing illegal here. You're identifying both the parties, but they say, well, no, you know, we won't agree to it. So it is, it is dependent upon the definitions and so forth. So, Something that is legal in one country, you know, gets, uh, you know, uh, illegal in the other country because of the difference in understanding of how the definition needs to be interpreted. Mm, Interesting. Faisal, this is a question for you. When, you know, when when it's defined as black or white or gray, um, you know, is I imagine the different uh, countries that the money gets transmitted from, um, sort of defines whether it is, you know, like you said, uh, of this category, whether it's gray or black, depending on, you know, the regulatory's um, assessment of it. Is it is it one of those things that just gets swept under the rug? It's not really a big deal. Um, regulators sort of look over it, or is it actually heavily regulated and there are repercussions for um, transmitting on, uh, uh, you know, a black uh, transmission? So, so, Every economy has a gray economy or a black. A black economy is very specifically criminal money, okay? So a gray economy is considered a parallel economy. It's money made through genuine means, not illegal means, but something that has not, taxes have not been paid on it. It's not declared, right? So when you have a uh, issues like, uh, you know, One country trying to sweep it under the rug. No, it's not going to happen. So every country has a profit and loss balance sheet. You know, every country has accounting. And if you have more money slipping out from the official books, the balance of payments, how the credit rating of the country, everything changes. You know, I mean, you can imagine if if you're running a company and you're not reporting certain income, uh, income that you could very well do with, your balance of payments, your 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 entire uh, accounting would go, you know, would right, look very right, right, right. Is this would look very weak? Is this a so, big reason why companies aren't getting into it? You know, do as a company, you know, considering getting into uh, remittances, look at this and say, oh, the mar- the market's not really as big as we thought it was, therefore it's not worth it. Is that is? Do you see that? Do you think that's happening as well? well no, I mean, why? U.S. companies or even companies uh, in Europe, et cetera, not getting into it is perhaps uh, for the risk of uh, offending people, maybe. It, it's because they have a very myopic view about the whole thing. They, they see a lot of inertia in getting into this business and sort of throw their hands up. Or they have very uh, skewed uh, opinion on how the whole thing is just related to money laundering and drugs and financing, et cetera. It's not that. 
it, it is a very regulated uh, industry. It is very stringent on documentation, etc. And because of the sheer volume of um, uh, rules, uh, you know, uh, how your elbow room is defined, how, whom you can operate with, whom you cannot operate with, and more importantly, down to the micro level, you know, this guy you're transferring money to, you can't transfer money to. This guy you can, this guy you cannot. So you have to check each and every transaction against multiple databases, etc. Each organization, each geographic territory, each channel. Mm-hmm. Uh, because of these challenges, people say, you know, well, it's just a matter of time. I'm going to get busted and I'm going to get right, fined. Right. I'm going to get fined heavily. So I'm not even going to entertain this industry. The, the, the thought of entering this industry. Right. But, you know, you, you have Western Union operating, you have RIA, MoneyGram, you have other players. So it, it, it's, you know, it, 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 you have a, so you're, you're an entrepreneur and it's almost, Says, well, how about we go and start making the uh, anti skid simulator for the 747, you know, for landing, uh, versus, let's say, making a bicycle shop in San Francisco? I mean, seriously, what, what's more difficult? Obviously, you know, you know, you know the, the, the bicycle shop is a no brainer. We're trying to make an anti skid control software for the 747 is going to be very, very serious. Uh, you know, uh, requires a lot of work in it. It's also the, uh, the mental pathway to do it is just not there. Someone else thinks, so I think, oh, someone I think else you just is there. I, I think exactly. you just excited exactly the mental pathway. I mean, it, it, they see it as such a enormous challenge. Uh, and for for a person like me myself, who's been involved in remittances, I I, I almost wonder. Uh, why is it that the U.S. counterparts, the companies, the startups, even you know, uh, not businesses who are already in the money business, do not look at remittances? It's, why do no, you think? What, uh, what's the what stands out? What do you? Why don't you think they are? The FUD factor: fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Absolutely, I Simple. agree. I, I I really can't give it any other name. Mm. It's just fear, uncertainty, doubt. If they were to sit down. Uh, I'll give you an example. I was uh, I had a client of mine, and you know they, they had, you know they wanted to go into the remittance space. Well, they did, really didn't want to go into the remittance space, but they wanted to do something. And <laughs> when they looked at the, the you know, the, I said, well, why don't you look at remittances? So they looked at it, and you know, they said, no, no way. You know, I mean, th- w- w- this is just too complicated. I mean, w- this is begging for trouble. God, this I love is asking that though. For trouble. Anytime yeah, it's, it's really complicated, that just means there's the high barriers to entry. Other people won't get in. Inefficiencies in the entire process and well, okay, forget, is forget, forget, forget cross border money transfer. I mean, I can understand some you know dude sitting in uh, North Carolina or in Nebraska, and I say, well, I wanted to send money to Pakistan. Would you like to get into business with me? I mean, you know, he's probably going to freak out, um, and that's okay. But let's talk about uh, let's talk about the domestic U.S. market. I mean, let's not even go international. If you were if you have an, an MSB license, let's say in the state of Illinois, and I literally challenge you to go to the, some of the big cities in, in, in the U.S., New York, San Francisco, Chicago, Dallas, Atlanta, what have you, and I want you to go and just walk into the bank or call them up and say, hi, uh, my name is you know Mike Townsend. I own a money transmitter license. I'd like to open a bank account. Mike, I can guarantee you that you will go through at least 50 banks before you even find a bank <laughs> willing to talk to you, talk to you, let alone do business with you. Well, wow. Probably not even going to happen today in today's world. Yeah. It's, um, uh, I, I know people who've gone down this path over the last uh, 10 years. And it's, every time it's, be- it's, it's, it's become thing. a joke, Brian, it's become a joke. It's almost like, you know, you're high on crack and you're trying to find a dealer. You know, hey, hey man, what, do you know where I can this? find so a bank? What, what's, do, do you know what, where I can find a bank that'll, you know, open a money transmitter account? Uh, it's, again, FUD. They, they yeah. see it as, you know, oh my God, if I open an account for Mike Townsend and tomorrow he does a transaction on of someone on the OFAC list and it gets flagged, well, the regulator in the state of Illinois is going to come crashing down on him. It's going to come crashing down on me. I'm going to get fined. Well, didn't that happen with HSBC and, S- and, and Standard Chartered Bank and, you know, yeah. who else, et cetera? So are they going to close me down? No, 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 no. We don't want to get into this business. Mm. You know, and I, I think it's, you got to really look at pre 9-11 and post 9-11. I mean, that's really where things got even more complicated. If we didn't have that environment, I don't, don't think, I think at this point we would have 
dozens of startups just going crazy in the market right now. But the, the post 9-11 changed everything. Yeah, it kills me. There, there's so many things that 9-11 did in a negative well, effect. I mean, you know, listen, but, 9-11 happened. Yep. Live with it, right? You, you, live the, with the it. rules are there. You live with it. You move on. You keep continuing with what you have to do. But that does not mean that you turn a complete blind eye to the opportunity that exists out there. Uh, you know, the world is 193 UN sanctioned countries and, you know, 220 countries, otherwise territories. We have to do business with them. Th- this is the a good point. Is flat, no? Faisal, what do you think if you're looking at a spectrum of zero to a lot, zero to 100, and you're saying, uh, you know, this, this is uh, an idealistic uh, extremely efficient system is a hundred, and then you know zero is this is completely broken. People are you know screaming on the streets. Where are we in terms of uh, the 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 system? And then you know what are some of the opportunities? What are you know is it from specific country to country? What are what stands out as user experience opportunities? So things that people you know even into? if I were to give an example of uh, something between zero and a hundred, uh, many people may not understand. I think we are. We are. Uh, we've just graduated from the cassette to the CD. Mm-hmm. You know, just sort of graduated from the cassette to the CD. So that's where we are, and you can imagine where music is today and where we are now, right now, with remittances. So oh, wow. uh, the very few companies that are using MP3 players and very very few that are all digital with iTunes and so forth. You mm-hmm. know, but most of the companies are still you know in between the cassette. And I hope you know what a cassette is. <laughs> Actually, I think it's the eight track tape and uh, and to the cassette. I don't think you right, know. right. Yeah. Are, 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 so, are they all so sprinting we, to get there? I mean, or is it like a jog, or is it like a walk? You know, are they all like, hey, we need this 2015? So here's here's something that they don't tell you. the The outlook that you see is a cassette. That means it's costing a lot to send the money, but the internal systems are pretty much up to date. So Ooh. that means it's costing them very few cents to move that money. What does that mean? You're making a lot of money. Now why spoil it? God, that screams business opportunity. Of course. So it, it, it is in Africa, it is almost criminal that you, if you have to send money to some countries in Africa, let's say $300, it'll probably cost you $48 or $35 just to send that money to $300. Can you imagine paying that much fees? <laughs> That's crazy. It, 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 it is crazy. Uh, and the actual cost of the transaction is perhaps less than quarter a percent, maybe half a percent, you know? So it, it's probably about a, a buck 50 at best for $300. And they, and they make a lot of money. Wow. Well, and what, 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 what stands out as some opportunities? I mean, is it, is it too much for a, you know, a founding team to dive into? Does cryptocurrency provide the platform for people to, you know, build, um, you know, user experiences no, online? I, I, I've written about cryptocurrency. I don't think so. It's going to provide a platform because of the, you know, the pricing issue and how do you. Even with uh, Ripple? I, I mean, uh, no. So Ripple is an ex- exception. Ripple is an exception to this uh, thing. Ripple can absolutely transform the entire remittance industry if you start seeing Ripple gateways and Ripple implementation in countries, in, in the beneficiary countries. Uh, and, and, not, and that's Ripple as a protocol, not Ripple as the XRP currency mm-hmm. itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ripple will provide a complete alternative to the SWIFT network that you currently have mm-hmm. that's used for, for for channeling money. So Ripple is a very, very strong contender, and I cannot uh, you know, stress that enough. Uh, the, the, I know those guys are working extremely hard in, in educating people and trying to have access to these markets, these you know, developing markets, and have them accept Ripple as a financial protocol. And Ripple, in my opinion, if you were to do the checklist, uh, qualifies on almost on every aspect of a payment network and a payment protocol that uh, one would require to be legal. One would require to be compliant. One would require to, you know, satisfy the requirements and the needs of the current world in 2014. Ripple does that. It's just that they need to have the implementation done. And I think once once you have greater adoption amongst the countries, you will definitely see that. Uh, moving money today is expensive. I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, Somalia, 
not even Somalia, Sudan. Sudan is a country that has trade sanctions against the U.S. Mm-hmm. Now, fair enough, you can't send money. Uh, guess how people, Sudanese in the U.S. are sending money? Well, of course they're sending money. They're sending it through gray channels. Now, what about the people who need to send money to Sudan uh, through the official channels? Guess what? You can't do it. Well, can do it or not allowed? Actually, we won't do it. It's allowed. The U.S. Ah. has a... Uh, has a thing that says, well, if you're going to send money to the south of Sudan, which we consider to be free, you're allowed to do that. But try doing it. No one's going to do it for you. You know, no money transmitter will touch Sudan, the south of Sudan, which is the southern government of Sudan, which is which is uh, an ally of the U.S. In, in, many, in many ways, if you will. I mean, it's a legal entity that is absolutely has no sanctions against it and so forth. But try sending it. Why? Because they feel they fear that the probability of the transaction hitting someone who is from the north, residing in the south, on the list is very high. And hence, you know, if that transaction goes through, they'll get into trouble. Mm -hmm. But here's the cool part. All the names are defined. So what's the issue? I mean, if the name is flagged, you don't do the transaction. Simple as that. You report it to your regulator, which you have to do anyways, automatically. So it's it's that fear, Mm. uncertainty, and doubt. So, uh, you know, Companies like Zoom uh, are, are uh, tackling this head on. It Zoom is one of the only examples I can cite that f- coming from Silicon Valley is a company that says, you know, hold on, remittances. Well, let's see how I could possibly, you know, displace Western Union into their own game or uh, you know, RIA or MoneyGram. And I think the biggest names that are still in remittances that people don't know about are and are going to make an impact. Because of the sheer fact that they'll have a settlement system to do so, uh, wallet to wallet, is going to be Visa and MasterCard. Because once Visa and MasterCard have enough rollouts in all the other countries so that person-to-person payments can be made frictionless in a, in a frictionless manner from one Visa card to the other, uh, I think it's it's only natural remittances will hop on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, there'll be a uh, uh, there'll be a pretty penny to pay for it, of course. But then there'll be companies uh, who would want to make, you know, even beat Visa and MasterCard to that game. You know, you know that's actually already taking place to some extent. <clears throat> if you go to the local drugstore or uh, Walmart, you can see, obviously, all these Visa and MasterCard gift cards, right? And, um, and interesting aside, and I've seen this rapidly expand recently, a lot of my clients have been kind of pointing this out to me that are in that space, that... You know, one of the ways that people are sending money abroad, they go and they buy a uh, prepaid card and then they use that card to purchase something at Amazon or some other international shipper and have the direct need, directly needed product delivered to their loved ones overseas. So in a sense, you have sort of this makeshift wallet that's already based on Visa and MasterCard. Now it's just a matter of digitalizing that entire prospect. And well, so here, there's again, a lot of people already there. Let, let's talk about the thing. So it, it is there, and I'll go one step further. You can now actually buy the wallet card in the U.S., ship it across to your friend and uh, you know, your family in, sure. in, let's say, Pakistan, and have them use it. But did that transaction show up in the accounts in Pakistan as a remittance yeah. transaction? No, it Never. did not. It showed up. It showed up as a foreigner using his card locally uh, as a CP card uh, as a POS transaction. You know, and that's how it shows up. It didn't so show Faisal, up. So, how does that change things politically? That's a big problem with the balance of trade, right? I mean, that's flight capital in a sense. It is. It is, and that's what they're trying to control. You can't. You can't. So, so what you do is almost every country has said, you can't just ship money to us. We will license the way you ship money to us. Uh, think about that. You can't, you can't send a letter to us. The only way you can send a letter to us is if you send it to one of the authorized post offices, you know, mm-hmm. or licensed post offices. So if you send a letter directly to XYZ through a company that is not licensed, we will, you know, we will go and close that company down. So if you are trying to send remittances through a channel that is not authorized or not official, that's deemed as an illegal transfer. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to regulate the receivers, the MTOs, the money transfer operators, which could be small companies or banks or what have you, and get them to get licensed. So all those transactions are reported into the system and hence into the ledger books of the government. 
uh, uh, the same thing is what US does. The US doesn't want any transaction to. This is why everything comes in through New York. This is why you never, you can't just. I mean, have you ever thought that you can't really send money directly to the US without without touching New York? Yeah. Have you ever thought about that? Very. True. I mean, there's no that you can. You simply cannot send money through Miami or or San Francisco or LA. These are all you know. Uh, uh, ports that I know of, but it has to come through New York. Why? Because that's how the system has been set up, so that the accounting and and monitoring can be made easy. Everything comes through New York through correspondent banks. All the correspondent banks are registered with FinCEN, which is the Financial Crime Enforcement Network, and that's how they make the transaction monitoring very easy. Which uh, and to add to that, they uh, they say, well, we're going to add another layer to it. Once that money comes into your state, you're going to have to, you know, monitor it again and report it on the state level. So, um, so, so, so they are licensing it to make it, you know, to to how do you say to mitigate the risk of illegal transfers coming and doing something wrong. Uh, has it worked? Certainly not, because the undocumented economy is still about 80% of the documented economy. I mean, that's a big number, you know? F- F- Faisal, where, where, where do you think it's going? I mean, do you think existing networks will start to facilitate payments with Facebook? Uh, you know, we touched on Ripple, but, you know, could uh, PayPal, I know to some extent, has limited cross-border, but they're a huge money mover. Do, is there, you know, could Facebook tomorrow turn on a switch and all of a sudden become a international money mover or other large social yeah. networks? You know, I answered a question on this thing. You know, what if if Facebook were to do, come into international money transfer, what would be the most probabilistic method for them doing so? Other than the part that they would have to go and register as a money service business in 220 countries or wherever Facebook operates, their easiest way would be to just piggyback on Western Union's license. And, you know, and Western Union natively implements itself in Facebook and voila, you can send money through Western Union through Facebook. Hmm. Seems like Western because Union this, should be doing that. <laughs> well, I, I don't know if they're doing that or not. Everyone's very mum about it. But, you know, uh, certainly. So when it, for, for me to send money across, as uh, you know, and, and I've done this research and I've talked to people, you know, blue collared workers all over the place, all over the country. Uh, uh, not just in, in my country, all over the world, from Norway, UK, US, Canada, you name it. And I asked them, well, what is it that you look for? So the first thing is, if the person in, let's say, the US is an illegal, and you know, that's part and uh, parcel of life. You have illegals living everywhere. They will never use the official channel to send money. So, I mean, that argument is finished. If you have a Mexican who's illegal in the US, they will never use the official channels to send money because, you know, it, they simply may not have the documentation or the, you know, or the ID or what have you to send that money. So they will use an illegal channel. So when you take that thing out of the equation, what's left? What's the, what's the problem? Why would you still prefer to use an illegal channel to send money? Well, the second thing is your recipients, you don't want to show uh, this money as tax money. You know, I mean, if you send this money across, they may be taxed on it. So this is why they will prefer illegal, uh, you know, an, an undocumented channel to send money across. Well, if you take even that uh, issue away, what is left? Well, it's the cost of the transaction and the time it takes to get there. So this is what many people are cracking, you know, giving it a crack at. Uh, they're trying to crack the code. Zoom is doing the same thing. You know, Western Union is trying to do the same thing. Uh, MoneyGram and, and other you know, competitors coming up in the space are trying, well, you know, we can send money seamlessly from point A to point B, tracking it all the way, lowest fees, fastest account credit, you know, best exchange rate, et cetera, et cetera. And that market is very much saturated. <clears throat> so what uh, is it, 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 it saturated with, with only certain specific corridors? So if you are looking at, let's say, the U.S.-India corridor, there isn't a, a way that you could actually lower the cost anymore, any further. And if you were to do that, you'd probably go into a loss. So then how do you make money? Well, then, you know, you, you, you're trying to not just look at the money transfer as a money transfer itself. You're trying to see, well, hold on, this guy is sending money across. What do I know about him? 
can I upsell him something? Can I sell him a ticket on Air India? Can Emirates sell him a discounted ticket to go to New Delhi? Can I send him some voice minutes from AT&T and so forth? So that's how they're taking it to a new level. Um, but does that mean that every company that is trying to enter the money transmission space has to look at sort of incentivizing it or building up a loyalty program? Certainly not. You You, you have to look at certain corridors. You have to see how you can... Uh, with with the U.S., I'll give you an example. Uh, very few money transmitters are willing to work overseas. That by itself, in itself, is a problem. Mm-hmm. So if you are a bank in India and you say, well, I want to work with a money transmitter that has licenses in all 50 states in the U.S., guess what? You'll have a very hard time trying to find someone like that to work with. So in itself, that is an issue. But even, you know, so if you're a startup from, let's say, the U.S. and you have all the 50 licenses, what will you do? Well, you'd certainly just just wave your hand and say, hey, I got the licenses and guess what? People will come running to you. And now then you make the better judgment of, you know, who can be a partner and whatnot. Uh, com- countries like Pakistan, for example, we provide an incentive when a remittance comes into the country. So let's say you're sending $1,000 from Chicago to Karachi. And when the money is received in Karachi, <clears throat> we uh, take that dollars, a thousand dollars, and give you the equivalent in rupees. And the amount that we give you is now one hundred percent tax free for life. So the government of Pakistan incentivizes the remittance channel, so that if you send it through the official channel, you got nothing to fear about because you're getting that money tax free. So if you send it through illegal channels and if that money is found in any manner, you will have to pay taxes on it. You'll be questionable to it. So this is why they are sort of giving an incentive for the illegal money transfers to come through the legal channel so that that money can be used in the economy freely without fear. And at the same time, the government of Pakistan's books improves, their, you know, their, their current account deficit improves, their, you know, they get better ratings, etc. So very few countries are doing this incentivization. But there's nothing a startup can do about this thing. You know, I mean, you can't have a startup in California saying to India, well, why aren't you doing the same thing? Right, so, right. It, it, so, so there are two different levels. And hopefully, if, you know, if, if the country sort of understands that, and you understand, well, then, then you've got to see, well, how can I move that money really fast into an official channel? How can I connect with all the banks, etc.? I'll give you an example. BDO is, um, is a bank in the Philippines called Bank de Oro. And Bank de Oro uh, has a, a, a thing that happens every 14th of February, <clears throat> Valentine's Day. And they say if you send $100 or something, you know, uh, by or before the 14th, uh, and it's, it's, it's a limited time offer. We'll give you a coupon for one of those. You know, they have some fancy bakeries over there. And we'll give you a coupon for, you know, for two, coffee for two. And they tried it. Uh, and uh, it, it was so successful. They ha- I mean, they sold out something like 50,000 coupons in a matter of a day. That's wow. it. You know, done. Wow. So again, it's incentivizing it. It's, it's, it's making the product better. You have a very stagnant product. There's only so much you can do with it. But if you can make the experience around it better, why not? And I think that's where, where, where the power lies. I mean, email is email at the end of the day. Why is Gmail better than Yahoo? Or why is Yahoo better than Hotmail? Why is Hotmail better than the defunct AOL mail? I don't even know if it's there or not. But, uh, you know, so, so you add there. on to Okay, oh, there you go. So you add on to it, you know, and you make it better. And if mm-hmm. you can make it better, uh, I think you have a very good, uh, chance of entering the market and gaining customers. That, I mean, it. <laughs> in this business, the customers are all over the place, so no, no, no difficulty in picking them up. Yeah, if you build it, they'll come. Yep, that seems now, to be true. You know, the, the, you gave sort of that legal topography about um, investment and, and motivation within uh, the government. Do you ever see in your, you know, obviously you're from a technology uh, point of view. You ever see government sort of enticing uh, mobile payments and remittances and smartphones? Do you see that coming through banking channels, possibly directly by government? Uh, or do you see sort of like the m thing where government later embraced it after somebody built it? So the government cannot in any manner uh, 
say that, you know, we want X, Y, Z vendor to come in. They have to be very generic about it. So what they do is they, um, and, and they may, and it's not the government, it's the, it's the regulator mostly. Uh, so, sure. f- for example, in, in Pakistan, the State Bank of Pakistan, which is the regulator, your uh, Federal Reserve equivalent, they will say, well, you know, if you're going to bring a mobile payment in, we will do everything in our power to facilitate you ASAP so that you can get on the market ASAP. <clears throat> Excuse me. We may not have the framework defined for it. We may not have the rules and regulations defined for it. However, to facilitate you, we will work with you. We will give you a pilot license that will allow you to do only so much transactions per month or so many you know, dollar volume per month. We'll cap it at some level. Until you get, and both you and I are comfortable with the regulations, the procedures, the framework, the reporting system, the audit system, etc. And once we are all comfortable, we'll remove that cap and you can go full-fledged. So they, uh, they, they don't uh, go out and advocate that they're looking for solution providers in the space. The solution providers are literally like... Um, uh, for lack of a better analogy, uh, lawyers chasing an ambulance, they're all over the place. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they go and look at countries, well, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. This guy, you know, this, in, in, in Pakistan, let's go talk to State Bank because they seem to be very open to the idea. And then everyone comes in through the door. So what State Bank ends up doing is then they have to sift through you know, hundreds of applications and then they start sending you know, ground rules. Well, hold on, we're not going to accept any application with a paid up capital of less than $2 million, you know. We will not accept any application if you're not from the banking sector. We will not accept any application if you don't have a banking partner. So they sift and filter the applications down until they get the very serious players and then they sort of, you know, help them get onto the bandwagon and, 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 go, and go live. So it's there, but not all the countries are doing it. I mean, if you go to India, um, they're very, very uh, slow about it. They're very, they're very cautious about such approaches. So it, it's mostly driven from the commercial consumer aspect of it. Someone thinks of an idea and they go approach the regulator and they say, well, can we do this? You know, can we, you know, Mr. Regulator, I would like to go and implement this. So, you know, and then they'll have a go at it and debate about it. Mm-hmm. Interesting. All right, guys, we've only got maybe another minute or so. Um, Faisal, I know we, we touched on Ripple, but I just found that to be fascinating and seemed like the inevitable future for cross-border um, money transmission. Do, do you agree there? Do you think that that's it? I mean, do you think well, if you're looking five, ten years down the road or maybe it takes more, is that what everyone's doing? I know if you exclude the you know legal side of it, maybe there's anonymous transactions to be made that attracts that, that population that wants uh, so, animosity you know, or uh, in, uh, animosity uh, uh, with anonymous transfers? No, so anonymous transactions are not going to happen in the world of remittances. I mean, it's as simple as that. If it has to be a black and white transaction, uh, if it has to be a white transaction, uh, uh, there is no gray area. It has to be identifiable on both the ends. And hence, Bitcoin is an issue. Uh, even if you mm-hmm. do bring the Bitcoin protocol in, then you have the, you know, how do you bring it into the fiat currency, etc.? you'll get identified over there. Uh, Ripple has an, um, a tremendous potential. I, I think it would be great to get um, the guys from Ripple to come over here and yeah, speak. Yeah, we should do uh, that. I think we should, yeah, we should definitely yes. get them on. And Because I do not think that anyone can explain a product better than them. And, you know, we can cross-question them. But I think uh, alternative payment networks are coming based on these cryptocurrency protocols. Um, they will eventually take over because the traditional... Uh, networks like SWIFT, etc., are going to feel the heat, uh, but they're not going to take it lying down either. Uh, SWIFT and all are going to reinvent the wheel because they'll be forced to. So I think it'll be an interesting space to see for the next between the next five and ten years. Yeah, yeah, it's been incredible, guys. Absolutely. This has been this has been an amazing educational podcast. I'm sure people around the world will find this very useful. Uh, with that said, guys, we'll uh, have this up in about a week and uh, look forward to the next one. Take Thank care. You. Have a good one. Take care. All right, guys. Bye.